25 years ago, a genocide has taken place in Srebrenica. More than 8,000 people lost their lives. And of course, the perpetrators were supposed to be brought to justice. TRT World Forum will continue to discuss what has happened at the time, uh, because we would like to commemorate uh, what has happened 25 years ago. So in memory of Srebrenica and those who lost their lives, today we will discuss the legal aspects of the Srebrenica genocide. What has happened, uh, what sort of legal instruments or institutions were set up, uh, whether people were brought to justice. Today, our uh, guest is Dr. Nevanka tromp Verkic. She is a well-known expert on this area. Actually, I would like to start with a uh, book that she has written, because uh, where we can see her expertise is unfolded. She has published a book entitled Prosecuting Slobodan Milosevic, Unfinished Trial. I think the title speaks for itself, so we will come back to that issue. Now, let me uh, introduce uh, Dr. Nevanka Trump to you, to our audience. Uh, she has expertise uh, in the study of political violence committed through mass atrocities and in transnational justice in post-conflict societies. Since 1992, she has been lecturer in East European Studies at the University of Amsterdam. Between 2000 and 2012, she was a member of the leadership research team at the International Criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. So she has a field experience in that sense. Between 2012 and 2013, she was attached at the Dutch Institute for War Documentation. Uh, Dr. Verkic, I would like to welcome to the TRT uh, World Forum uh, and thank you for joining us. I just would like to start off with the following question. Do you think that a significant uh, investment was made into the legal institutionalization in order to bring people to justice as far as the victims of uh, Srebrenica uh, and ex, let's say, Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, uh, were concerned? Uh, thank you for this very important question. You know, when I started working in the field of international criminal justice, I thought that were at the beginning of very important process that will lead to a global justice system at after 25 or even more years now, 27 years that Yugoslavia tribunal was formed, I thought we would have many of such original trials and many of uh, criminal trials dealing with mass atrocities. But now in hindsight, uh, when I talk about my work experience, it seems that it was a moment in a history that the international community could get away from political influences and form Yugoslavia Tribunal and year after in uh, 1994 Rwanda ad hoc tribunals. And um, so if you ask me uh, how this experience working on mass atrocities and institutionalized response to mass atrocities uh, now seems to me, uh, I must say that it was a unique experience and that I regret very much that young generations of researchers as I was at the tribunal and lawyers actually have been trained now by huge numbers. All university uh, over the whole world are having curricula on, on international criminal justice, but what is happening, we have less and less such crimes. Why? Because politics interfered, and I'm afraid the future of, uh, of uh, trials of mass atrocities are going to be grimmer than we ever, ever dreamt 30 years ago. Well, I think that's a very uh, pessimistic observation, unfortunately. And as we can see in, in many uh, parts of the world, we can see people were forced to flee, uh, they were massacred here and there, and I think I, uh, uh, we have to agree with you that the international community fails to sustain international setup in order to bring people to justice. Now, let's a uh, little bit talk about the um, uh, International uh, Criminal uh, Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, known as ICTY, especially with regard to the Srebrenica. So what was the scope of this uh, uh, court? What was the mandate that the court had at the time? Uh, 
if uh, many of uh, your younger audience will hardly remember these exciting times at the beginning of the 90s when Europe actually faced uh, one of the, uh, at that moment, bloodiest conflicts in the world. And you know, when things happen in the heart of Europe, as uh, former Yugoslavia was and the Balkans is, then you can expect actually much more dynamic response, political, diplomatic, and in this case, a novel one, legal. So what happened during the Yugoslav wars, you could see that the whole international community uh, was busy with this particular conflict, the first conflict uh, in Europe after the Second World War, and the first one that actually inaugurated the end of the Cold War. So on the one side, we had extremely hopeful uh, pronouncements, Cold War is over and there is a bright future of liberal democracy ahead of us. And then people did not uh, realize that if we look at the uh, disintegration of former Yugoslavia with such a violence and still disintegration of Soviet Union, as we see that there are uh, uh, still uh, many unstable periods, we, to, to, a more realistic uh, view on this was is that Cold War and consequences of the Cold War are still ongoing. And not just in the Soviet Union and former communist parts, but look what is happening with the, with the, with the America. So this is a large pretext to tell you that things were happening in Europe and international community hurried to help out. So there was a robust political, diplomatic and not so robust military inter, uh, uh, involvement of uh, not just the uh, UN, but also individual states and including a still then emerging European uh, Union. And you know what is so important? In 1993, there was a war in Bosnia-Herzegovina. This war in Bosnia-Herzegovina was ongoing uh, since April 92. And the prime group that was attacked in this war were Bosnian Muslims. So, you know, Europe and international community led by that time, still by United States, didn't quite know how to respond to it. Liberals like me and many other people actually thought that there is a moral duty to stop carnage as it was happening in Bosnia, regardless which group is uh, targeted. But uh, what we have seen that uh, in 93, uh, world citizens were actually demanding from their democratic leaders to use military force to stop uh, war and to stop uh, violence against uh, uh, Bosnian Muslims. And international community was very reluctant. So in, uh, in, in April or in the summer of 93, they actually thought up something to uh, lower the pressure of their own constituencies, and I'm talking about the Americans, uh, Western Europeans, and they said, okay, we cannot intervene to enforce peace because the UN still did not have a mandate for enforcing the peace, and uh, NATO used for the first time force during uh, Bosnian uh, war, but just a little bit. So they said, look, we are going to prosecute all these wrongdoers. But you know, in May 93, when the mandate was written uh, and, uh, and uh, published or, or pronounced by Security Council of UN, um, people were actually expecting more robust political and, and, and military response. So we had world leaders at that time using Security Council of UN, as you know, uh, the muscles of UN, we know that all power of United Nations is in Security Council and not in General Assembly. And they came up in May with a resolution. And in this re resolution, they actually said that they're going to uh, investigate and uh, prosecute uh, wrongdoers in uh, perpetrators, individual perpetrators in the former uh, Yugoslavia. And, but they also 
NATO added to their mandate maintenance of peace, which is quite exceptional because in a criminal law, there are three classical uh, legal um, objectives. One is to punish perpetrators, second is to administer justice to victims, and third one is obviously to deter any other perpetration for, for the criminals and those who might engage in mass atrocities. But forming a tribunal with extra legal mandate, non-legal mandate to maintain the peace was quite novel and very tricky. How can one expect from a legal institution to maintain the peace? Well, of course, I mean, the court does not have any uh, military power, doesn't have any economic pressure in order to, you know, keep the peace or the, you know, maintain the peace. But as you have said, I think the mandate was a little bit problematic. And I think you uh, are right that the international community uh, failed to respond very effectively in the case of uh, uh, former Yugoslavia when the atrocities among the ethnic groups or religious groups started to uh, you know rise and religion you know played a important role so what we have seen in the case of Srebrenica for example we have seen uh, the fall of let's say western civilization in a sense there was a huge disruption actually in the western civilization where the um, uh, you know the pluralism diversity were supposed to be celebrated but after the uh, end of the Cold War, we have seen the uh, hot war, I would say, the conflicts. And since then, we see the conflicts have been going on, not only uh, in the Balkans, but also in Africa, in the Middle East, as you can see now in Syria, in Rwanda. And still, in the international community seems to be not very effective in addressing those questions, because uh, the international organizations, uh, are not very effective. If you look at the UN, if you look at EU, if you look at organization of Islamic countries, I mean, no matter where it comes from or no matter where it belongs to, so there is that kind of insufficiency. Uh, but, you know, uh, there was that uh, tribunal, this court was established. Now, the people were expecting, of course, that this court would have been very effective. And you said the perpetrators were supposed to be brought to justice by, the, by this court. Do you think that the International Crime in, uh, Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia achieved its goals as it was set up in the beginning? Whether this court brought to justice uh, the perpetrators of the war or uh, it was not very successful? What is your assessment of the effectiveness of the uh, uh, court? Uh my dear professor, as you know, uh, in uh, international relations and in the uh, international politics and politics, we can only assess something if we have material to compare it. This code started as a unique uh, endeavor, ad hoc one. Everyone knew that it's going to, to have a limited time. And um, because of, uh, uh, of, of just uh, Yugoslavia Tribunal and Rwanda Tribunal, we actually got two unique experiments and we could not compare to anything alike. So Tribunal issued altogether 161 indictments and UN at the time said that it was a paradigm of uh, uh, efficiency. Uh, but if you look into the uh, outcome of uh, generally of indictments becoming eventually uh, judgments, then we see that there are several flaws. For example, from the very start, the major perpetrating group was, were Serbs, Serbs from Croatia, Bosnia, and Serbs from Serbia. But Serbia in the same time was always extremely powerful in anti-ICTY uh, tribunals uh, uh, narrative and propaganda saying that it was anti-Serb institutions. So the whole world expected that this court will be extremely severe on Serbs because Serbs professed that it is going, the court was going after the Serb perpetrators. And then after uh, 25 years of the working of tribunal, you see that Serb perpetrators actually fared very well. You said uh, we cannot compare with other cases because this is a unique case. But even if it is a unique case, maybe 
uh, you can tell us whether it met the expectations of people on the ground, whether it is the uh, Muslims or the international community, or whether it is the liberal people like yourself. Um, you know what? One of the uh, biggest issues with, with international criminal justice that uh, makes it very, very different than any national jurisdiction is that people uh, ask themselves, could slow justice be a justice at all? Because we see that some cases take for such a long time. Uh, several of uh, indictees or accused died. Uh, and that was something that um, actually disappointed the big, big time uh, victims because victims needed a swift justice. M victims needed efficient justice. And uh, this has been one of the of the huge issues. And we see it with the other uh, even permanent uh, tribunal, uh, International Criminal Court. They all seem to be very different than uh, national criminal justice because all these cases can drag for very, very long time. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that mm. has been a huge, huge problem. Yeah. Well, okay, then let me uh, uh, come back to the issue of numbers. You know, uh, mm -hmm. what I know is that only 90 people were, I think, sentenced to different sort of, uh, uh, you know, prisons. Uh, we are talking about a huge crime, a war crime. Uh, we are talking about, you know, massive killings of people and massive, I think, deportations. In a sense, uh, demographic engineering of a whole, I think, uh, region or the country. Uh, do you think that this will uh, really please people or satisfy that, uh, you know, at least, you know, 90 people were sentenced or uh, the number should have been uh, even uh, more? Uh, you know, from uh, 161 indictees, if you have 90 people, who, uh, who, who, who were sentenced eventually and were convicted of some crimes. There were, of course, some acquittals. That is quite a serious, uh, serious number. But it's uh, very important what these numbers hide. A tribunal has been very careful never to divulge and put too much, atten uh, much attention on nationality of these people because there was this general idea that uh, uh, such courts should actually prosecute uh, individuals from all sides. But in the case of tribunal, it proved very artificial uh, pronouncement because when tribunal tried to indict and prosecute, for example, a representative of Bosnian Muslims, many of these prosecutions uh, end up in acquittals. So people ask themselves why, per definition, uh, such an institution should insist that all uh, sides of the war must be guilty of something. So in the case, in, in insisting on this and not actually saying that the biggest uh, perpetrating side in the numbers of indictees were Serbs, uh, there was a creation of some, uh, we call it uh, equation uh, of, of guilt, like this, this was a war and whichever side was in a war must be guilty of something. It was not like that. What is important in criminal cases is criminal intent. And one never can uh, uh, compare in, or, or uh, equate, uh, make similar or the same, the crimes that Ratko Mladic and uh, uh, General Ratko Mladic, Serb General, committed in Srebrenica in July 95 with, for example, Nasser Oric, representative of Bosnia Serbs, who were there with uh, 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 all people fled in Srebrenica and who were trying to survive in uh, impossible circumstances. So without understanding criminal intent of Serbs, uh, and and um, one uh, can make this, uh, this uh, awful mistake uh, saying that all parties uh, took part in atrocities and all parties are guilty. What my work absolutely showed is that Bosnian Muslims and Kosovars, uh, Kosovo Albanians in Kosovo were major uh, victims in this war. And what disturbs me as a researcher who worked inside the institution and now follows it is that these two post-Yugoslav uh, states were nominally perceived by uh, West 
as a majority Muslim states, and if you look at all, all Yugoslav post uh, uh, successor states, only Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina have been internally divided and made unstable. And that was something that I think comes deep from the complete uh, lack of understanding of Western world. What is the Muslim uh, corpus in the Balkans? What do they represent? Uh, I don't think that I should tell your television and your audience that these Muslims in Balkans share the values of Europe and have been very loyal citizens and very loyal to, to all values that Europe represents. But somehow they have been um, they have been perceived in a completely different way in the post-Cold War. And I think there are several reasons for that. One is the cultural Islamophobia that became uh, global after uh, Cold War. There were no communist uh, capitalist uh, uh, divisions anymore. And that Iran uh, revolution in the 80s actually made Islam a possible political threat to, to, uh, to uh, Western world. And they made a huge mistake actually um, treating and understanding that Bosnia and Kosovo uh, represent any of, of uh, threats to, to this order. And unfortunately, we could see it and we see it now also how and Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina have been uh, divided and thus politically um, diminished in, uh, in, in, in their potential. Thank you.